In 1979, my parents accepted a, an appointment with the Home Mission Board of the Southern Baptist Convention, and the Home Mission Board decided to put my parents within an hour of their hometown in Greenwood, so they moved them to Anderson, even though they were willing to go anywhere in the country, including Alaska, California. They were willing to go wherever God needed them to go, and they ended up at home. Well, I entered fifth grade, halfway through the fifth grade year at Concord Elementary, Finished at Concord after sixth grade, went to McCants Junior High School when it was down on Fan Street, then went to Hannah 10th, 11th, 12th grades, graduated Hannah, went to Army National Guard between my junior and senior year of high school, and then went to basic training and combat medic school as an E1 private right after high school. Then started college a semester late and started ROTC another year later. and. Uh, that's how I earned my commission. So I went from E1 to E5 in about two and a half years, and then was commissioned as a, an O1 second lieutenant. My parents didn't make a lot of money, so I felt I needed to help them with college expenses. And so I joined the National Guard to help out, but I joined primarily because I wanted to serve the country. I had great mentors and my uncles and, and wanted to serve like they did. I was interested in medicine at five years old, watching Emergency One on TV with Were you really? Johnny Gage and Roy DeSoto, yeah. And wanted to be a paramedic when I was five or six, and then wanted to be a medical missionary when I was eight. Grew up in church. Uh, of course, uh, I felt a call to missions before my parents even uh, expressed their call, even though they had been called uh, as teenagers. I had always been fascinated with emergency medicine. Started with Greg Shore's Ambulance Service, Anderson Ambulance Service, now Medshore Ambulance Service at 15 years old. Greg was the first paramedic in Anderson County. And so favorite experiences was riding third person initially and then Greg teaching me how to drive an ambulance. And I remember thinking, you know, life is fragile. And my 15 year old immature mind was processing what I'd experienced. I thought, well, life is fragile, therefore it's meaningless, or life is fragile, therefore it's precious. I chose precious, and I've worked on that concept and off of that baseline sense. So when you joined the military and went to basic training, where, where was that at? Basic training was at Fort Bliss, Texas, in El Paso. I started on the 4th of July, 1986. Oh, it was 120 high. degrees. Yeah, it was hot. <laughs> Graduated basic training, they put us on buses. A number of us went up to San Antonio, combat medic school. Ten weeks of training there. Did very well because I'd been on an ambulance already three years. Had any of your cohorts that were studying had that kind of experience? Some did, yeah. Did some, were, some were already EMTs. Okay. Um, most were very were more, uh, were older than I was, so I was I had just turned eighteen. Yeah, I joined the National Guard when I was seventeen, a month after I turned seventeen. So my entire senior year of high school, I was a soldier, and learning how to be a soldier before I went to basic training and and advanced individual training combat medic school. It was fantastic. Had a, a missionary couple there who my parents introduced me to, and the Atkinsons really adopted me for the time I was in San Antonio. I went to church with them in a Spanish-speaking church on Sundays and then ate lunch with them on Sunday afternoons and uh, stayed with them on, on most Sunday afternoons before they took me back to the base uh, because we got at least Sundays off uh, most Sundays during that training. You finish up your second schooling in mm -hmm. San Antonio, then where does Uncle Sam want you to go? I go back to South Carolina. So I'm back here in Anderson with the 263rd uh, Air Defense Artillery, when, it's, when it was a battalion and not a two-star command. When I started at Carson Newman, it made sense for me to transfer to the Tennessee National Guard, so I went to the 278th Armored Cavalry Regiment and um, became a cadet shortly after that. Uh, so I was a simultaneous membership program cadet. So I got to be an ROTC cadet and serve as a soldier in the Tennessee National Guard. Uh, and when I was an SMP cadet, we had a shortage of officers in the medical company within the armored cavalry regiment I was working in. And so I was a platoon leader as a cadet. I mean, I've had so many great mentors along my career and in my personal life, Paul, that I, I there's no way I can 
thank God enough uh, for bringing me through it, what I've come through. During your 30 years, you did some pretty unique things for yeah. your country. Yeah. Um, the top three would be what of all the assignments you had? <laughs> wow. Well, the last active duty assignment, I was actually scheduled to be the G2, G3 for the 3rd Medical Command in Kuwait, running all the medical operations for the entire Central Command region. That was in 2013. I was a combat support hospital commander at the time in the Army Reserve on active duty for a year in Kuwait, running all over the Middle East as I had before. Um, and I got a call in November from one of my mentors. He said, well, we've gone through all the dossiers of all of our 06s, captains and colonels in the Navy, Air Force, Army, Marine, Coast Guard, and you're the only one who has experience with consequence management WMD, weapons of mass destruction, counterproliferation, and nonproliferation. So we've got a mission that we have in mind for you. And it involves a nation in the Middle East. And I said, my curiosity has peaked. He said, do you know where I'm going with this? I said, I think I do, but it sounds like we need to get on a secure phone. And so about a month later, I was in Washington, D.C., prepping for the Syrian chemical weapons demilitarization. And our U.S. support to the United Nations and the Organization for Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, OPCW, to locate and transport and destroy Syria's priority one and priority two chemical weapons and precursors. And we destroyed about the 600 tons of mustard agent and precursors for nerve agent on board the main trailer deck using very novel technology to destroy it. To destroy that chemical weapon. Out, weapon. out at sea. Out at sea, yep. And so we containerized all of the effluent in that process and then transported that to Germany and then they incinerated at a uh, hazardous materials incineration facility. And had you not destroyed those chemicals, where would they have ended up and who would they have hurt? Some of those materials have been used against Syrian citizens, against the opposition forces that were going against President Bashar al-Assad. And of course, al-Assad had Vladimir Putin's support. I think probably one as complex was converting as the commander a smoke battalion in the Army Reserve to the Army's first chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, explosive incident response force. The Marine Corps has the CBRF Chemical Biological Incident Response Force, um, but this was to be a supercharged unit out of the Army for the consequence management mission of the Northern Command and U.S. Army North, primarily for defense support of civil authorities to augment our civilian authorities, uh, emergency response authorities, emergency management authorities, public health. In case of a major incident, uh, we would go in, we would not take over, we would truly augment, provide resources and support for the civilian authorities. And so we were able to train up a unit of about 1,200 soldiers um, in nine months, validate uh, a, a converted smoke battalion into this new unit um, within nine months. Uh, we had seven days to validate the unit, uh, but because of our soldiers and our leaders and Hopefully I had something to do with it as commander. Uh, we have validated in two days wow. and just practiced the rest of the five days yeah. of our validation time on our operations. And that was a great experience. We did deploy several units to assist in, in other parts of the world, other parts of the nation. And that structure that we developed and the training process and validation process we developed for that unit became the model for the entire Department of Defense including the National Guard Homeland Response Forces, and there are 10 of those right now, as well as the Consequence Management Response Force assets. Wow. And another is uh, training up and validating and then operating with a sensitive site exploitation team. Trained up four teams in 2003, shortly after we went into Iraq. Um, it was brought on uh, from the Army Reserves again onto active duty. Uh, had been doing some of that work as a civilian in the intelligence enterprise and uh, was asked to do it for our U.S. Army Technical Escort Unit uh, to support our special operations forces 
and other forces on the ground in Iraq primarily, but also Afghanistan. And then I was able to not only train and validate Team 4, but command Team 4 and supported the Special Mission Unit community as, as the commander of that team. Well, since moving back here from Maryland, I've been involved with Anderson County Emergency Management Division. And then in 2008, it went into the Sheriff's Office, and so it's now part of the Sheriff's Department. Uh, so I've been, I continue to work part-time as an Emergency Management Coordinator, uh, primarily on the, on the big stuff, you know, the, the winter storms and the uh, tropical depressions and, and tropical storms, tornadoes, things of that nature. Treasure that time and, and I continue to, to use that not only to benefit the county but also benefit my students as an Anderson University professor. I chair Homeland Security and Emergency Services degree programs and so I want to stay engaged in the community that, that I'm supposedly a professional for. <laughs> so I want to keep my prof uh, professional expertise so I can provide those best practices and lessons learned to my students. And I still work part-time with Anderson County Emergency Medical Services as well as a part-time paramedic and the command staff. What's going on up there on that second floor with all your cohorts? Well, a lot of communication and a lot of logistics. So that's really what we're trying to do. We're not commanding any scene. Now, public health situation like COVID-19, um, that's a little bit different, but most of our effort is getting situational awareness of what's going on, sharing what we're learning with decision makers so they can make effective decisions, maybe providing them some uh, recommendations for decisions, uh, giving them courses of action so that they can choose and make an educated decision or a high, you know, they can choose whatever they want to do as the county council chair uh, and, and county administrator because they're in charge of public safety for the county uh, or the sheriff um, as the chief law enforcement officer of the county. So we brief them, we continue to brief local officials, we work with state, local, federal, non-governmental business leaders to become more resilient and better prepared for the next disaster, but certainly to get through and bounce back economically, culturally, and, and environmentally from the disaster we're dealing with. And since your retirement, you become a professor at Anderson University. Tell me about that role. I actually helped develop the program, was part of a team of emergency management and emergency services management uh, leaders uh, in 2011 that uh, Professor George Duckworth, uh, our former solicitor here, in Anderson and Oconee counties um, pulled together as the Dean of the School of Criminal Justice and we determined that we needed a degree completion program for emergency responders, emergency managers, military personnel, those folks, so they could get their their bachelor's degree online and so we started it out in 2011-2012. Um, I was the lead curriculum developer uh, as an adjunct professor uh, to build that program from scratch um, with a lot of help from a lot of friends. And then in 2014, we had enough students and I was actually deployed overseas, overseeing the Syrian chemical weapons demail situation and uh, got an email from Anderson University saying, hey, we'd like you to come on board full time. And I said, I'd love to, can you wait a month? <laughs> and they could, they worked with me. And so uh, when I got off of active duty, um, in t late 2014, came to work full time with Anderson University as a, uh, a professor, or assistant professor. I've now been promoted to associate professor, and, and I chair the Homeland Security and Emergency Services Management programs. I've been able to work with the best people in the world, and I've been able to see God at work in my life, and working to grow me up, and working through me to help others, and of course, seeing His work in others helping me to get the big missions accomplished that would be impossible without them. So it's, it's been an amazing 34 year career and 39 and a half years as emergency services now. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's been amazing.